Um, next up, we have Jimmy Haywood. And Jimmy, despite his accent, was born in the UK and then graduated in mechanical engineering at MIT. And coming from a different non-healthcare background, he's got a different approach to improvement. And he's going to talk about how we empower patients through technology. So we're just going to hook up the laptop. Just to remind you that do send your questions through Twitter. We're going to take these at the end to all three speakers. So do send them through for Lucy and Jamie and Enrico, who's coming up next. So um, as you said, I'm an engineer. And I think that I don't need audio. It's OK. OK. Yep, thank you. Um, I'm an engineer. And, and I got into healthcare. Uh, for I think many of the same reasons that many of you did. Someone that I loved, my brother, um, Stephen was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in 1998. And I began a journey of trying to initially work on discovering a treatment for ALS. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to reflect for a moment on you know, the context of healthcare and discovery and, and begin with just this sort of symbol of health, this heart. And, critique it for a moment as an engineer. One of the things that I don't like about this symbol is it's sort of static. It's a moment in time. It, it's sort of a component. And as an engineer, um, I have a little bit of an obsession with vectors. Vectors are things that have origins and magnitude and position. And you can understand a vector by looking at its trajectory. And if you look at health from a vector perspective, you can measure certain domains. So let's say I was interested in mobility. And mobility would be a vector that would start very low. I have a two-year-old at the beginning of that curve. I have a four-year-old uh, about halfway up. I have a 12-year-old who, uh, when I was out swimming with her the other day, might be approaching as quick as I am. I'm now on the declining side of that curve. And my father, who I uh, exercise with um, twice a week, is on the significant declining side at age 73. So that component of health is something we can measure and understand, and it's one of many dimensions of health that you could evaluate. Let's look at, for example, well-being, another dimension of health that has been shown to be critically important. Um, this is a, a, a sort of a guess at my well-being line. I was a very happy child. I was born here in London uh, and then grew up as sort of a round, bouncing baby boy. And then I went to middle school, where my ego was crushed, along with most of the other young boys at that time, and I it went quite low. Got up into high school and then college, started dating, and I was a happy, again, got my first job, uh, things were going well, and then I had children, and my well-being crashed again. Now, if you study the literature on this, and it's quite comprehensive, um, by the time my children leave for college, and that for me is another 16 years with my two-year-old, uh, my well-being will almost return to the level it would have been if I'd never had them. <laughs> Ultimately, though, health uh, affects your well-being, and you begin to become unhealthy, and your well-being is connected. Now, disease, presumably, is the impact on this. And since I study motor neuron disease, you can see that immediately motor neuron disease has a dramatic impact on your mobility. And it has an impact on your well-being, though not a predictable one, because it goes down and then returns to where it was. Um, this is sort of my brother's. Until the end of the disease, when you can't speak and you can't connect, and it becomes quite difficult. Now, the reason I put these lines up here is that, essentially, I think that we know virtually nothing about these vectors in our population or the impact of the things that we call healthcare on them in any comprehensive way. As an engineer, I find that unacceptable. Each disease invents its own delta, its own measure from this. And, and from that, we pretend to have some holistic knowledge. But it doesn't add up, because we're not using the same language or the same understanding. All right, so I'm going to do a very quick 10-minute history of all biomedical research and attempt to describe how we accomplish the top goal here. So our goal in life, in healthcare, is health span. Presumably longevity, though I think health span is more important, and reduced disease. We accomplish that by discovering things. We invent ideas. Smoking causes lung cancer. Gleevec treats CML. Obesity causes heart disease and diabetes. These things are discoveries that are then validated through either clinical or behavioral research, a completely separate system, by the way and then are deployed through behavioral change, environment, 
and health care, and those presumably result in health span. Now, each of these separate systems operate differently, and let's go through them all. So I'm going to start with mice. Um, that is my daughter. Uh, that is a mouse that has ALS. That is my brother. And the reason I mention this is that when you have a disease like ALS, you want to find anything that will help make you live longer. In this case, you look to animal research because there isn't any clinical evidence. And this is a paper that shows that Celebrex, a drug, makes mice with ALS live longer. It was published back in, uh, in, uh, in 2002. And Stephen, of course, started taking the drug based on this paper because he thought that it might help him live longer. In medicine, in my talks, you want to be on the blue line. You don't want to be on the red line. So the blue line is the good line. And, and because I was running a research lab attempting to cure Stephen, I replicated this experiment. Now, that was my first pass. And in this case, the blue line wasn't any better. And I figured, you know, I'm just a young engineer and I'm not a professor at Hopkins. I must have done something wrong. So I did it four more times. And uh, I still couldn't see any difference. And I struggled with this. Stephen still took the drug until the human clinical trial failed and none of the patients got any better. And there was a big debate about whether the mouse was predictive of the human disease or not. And I wondered what the real problem was. And so I actually um, did some more research and I tested every major finding that led to human trials in ALS and repeated them all. I think I might be the only person in the history of a, any field of science to have ever done this individually. And I couldn't replicate a single result that led to all of the failed clinical trials. Now that should scare you all um, because thousands of people committed to doing studies on this basis and none of it worked. In fact, three of the trials made the patients die faster. So there was a problem. Nature wrote a big editorial, there was a scandal, and nothing changed. Turns out I'm not the only one with this problem. This is results from Bayer that showed that they were unable to replicate 80% of the results of companies and the technologies they bought from academia. This is a result from Amgen that showed they could not replicate 65% of the primary cancer targets and information on which they based their research program. So we have a problem in Rome, as it were, that maybe things aren't working very well. So that's the discovery side. Let's go and talk about clinical research for a minute. Um, clinical research is the process of testing essentially two groups of people, those that get a treatment and those that get a control. And you evaluate an array of measures on a human being to determine whether they live longer, much the same as what I did in mice. And if you get a successful result, you get a graph like this. Um, where you want to be on the blue line. Um, and the patients on the blue line, in this case using the drug lithium to slow ALS, did quite a bit better. And so therefore, many patients took lithium. Sadly, and I'm guessing you can get to the punchline, four clinical trials that followed up on this all failed. So the initial promising result did not work out to be true. Um, and, in, and if you analyze the repeatability of clinical research, this is uh, John Ioannidis, um, and, and your own local hero, Ben Goldacre, whose analysis has shown that there's an immense amount of bias and difficulties in these interpretations, say that the clinical research side of this equation is having problems as well. Okay, so we've done discovery, which clearly has some issues, and we've discussed clinical research, which clearly has some issues. Let's talk about healthcare itself. This is my favorite paper. It's in the BMJ. And it is an article about whether or not there is sufficient clinical evidence for a doctor to recommend a patient use a parachute when jumping out of an airplane. The primary conclusion is that there is not because it has not met the clinical evidence standards for recommendation. Now, what I love about this is there's a bunch of papers in this series, and one of them says, well, you know, but we did the tests on sheep, and we have already established you can't translate animal research to human research, so it doesn't work. And, but, the, but the jokes of this are of course you should use a parachute. But medicine is full of many other obvious things. People who have 50% blockages in their coronary arteries should have cabbages to prevent um, heart attacks. It just turns out that those aren't true, and we don't check them very often. And so what seems obvious may not be obvious in the practice of medicine, and we don't check or evaluate that. Um, even when we have the evidence, and this is Don Berwick's Institute data, 
um, about why physicians don't follow the guidelines, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons. Um, and my favorite one of this is, is part of healthcare. If you were to take the 10 leading causes of death from 2006, I believe this data is, um, and put preventable medical errors in the list, in the United States, it would beat diabetes as the cause of death. Now, I'm just an engineer. I'm new to your field. This feels like there might be some problems here. I think that the problem that we have in healthcare as we talk about how to fix this problem is essentially how do we separate the wheat from the chaff. Now the wheat from the chaff story is that of course when you harvest wheat you have to separate the wheat from the straw because if you plant straw or attempt to make bread out of straw it doesn't actually work. And, and from what we've just seen in both the process of discovery or care or clinical research we're not separating these. And this is the basis on which we practice this industry that takes somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of our gross domestic product. This is not the way other industries work. So I didn't come to be depressing. I came to be hopeful. And um, I want to talk about a new way of looking at this problem. I think that patients might be the window into the soul of healthcare and that they might provide the ability to see a new answer. And I'm going to show you what we built as our website, to what Patients Like Me does, to attempt to answer some of these questions. So I'm going to be an MS patient, um, and I'm going to come in and say I have MS. And you'll see all these patients. We have ALS patients and chronic headaches and major depressive disorder and, and, and bipolar disorders. But I'm going to filter this, and now we're going to look at MS patients. And I'm going to, by the way, I'm not logged in. You can all go do this this afternoon on the outside of our website. And I'm going to come and look at uh, people, people that are on Tisabri, a drug I'm interested in. So now I've filtered down from 30,000 to 1,500 patients who are on Tisabri. I'm going to look for people that have had MS for at least five years, but not much longer than, say, 10 or 12. I'm going to look for people like me. I'm going to be a, a woman at the moment. And, um, and I'm going to want someone about my age. So I'm refiltering the clinical data from patients like me down to those like me. But I'm going to be more specific. I want patients that are healthy. I don't want the sickest patients. I want the ones that, that feel like this is working. So I'm finding this group of patients. And you'll see now, here's a patient named Gardner who's all green. She's doing well social, mentally, and physically. She has no impairment from her MS. Her cognition, vision, speech, swallowing are all normal. But she's in a, having a bad day because she has fatigue right now. So let's go and look at her profile, her medical record, as it were, in this new world of outcomes, and look at, she joined PLM in 2007, we know her social, mental, and physical quality of life over the last couple of years, and we know her MSRS, which is the clinical, Christianity, a clinical rating system for this disease that comprehensively measures multiple domains, and we know her essentially history over the last five years, prospectively, which is probably about three times longer than almost any clinical trial. We know the Gantt chart of what she's done to treat her disease, switching from Capaxone to Tisabri. She uses vitamin D and Baclofen to manage spasticity. How she manages her allergies or her depression, switching from different drugs to find one that works for her. Interestingly, when I searched for a Gantt chart, which is a standard engineering tool in 2002 when we were doing some patent work, we found one example of a Gantt chart of treatments against outcomes in medicine. It was amazing to us. So we give this to everyone. Here are her symptoms over the last five years of anxiety, depression, fatigue, which is her primary issue, insomnia and pain, sexual dysfunction, all available. You can go look at this patient right now and her latest update. So this information exists and we roll it up into an opportunity to understand and learn and this becomes part of our research process. So if I, if I click on one of the objects here that I want to learn about, let's say MS, or sort of provigil, I can learn about the 1,700 patients on it. They're using it for fatigue, for excessive daytime sleepiness, and I can filter this data only for MS patients. So I could look at this and say, how do MS patients use this drug differently than other patients? What's the dose they use? What are the side effects they experience? Why do they stop taking it? How long have they been on the drug? How much do they spend? How adherent are they? This kind of information, this is, now Provigil is a commonly used secondary drug in MS. It's never been studied by the company. So this is the only data on the use of this drug in the MS population that exists in the world. All created by patients. What's it like to have MS? The severity of each symptom 
that could be adjusted for the severity of the disease. What people think about the perceived effectiveness and side effects or tolerability of each drug. The age of the patients in the system, their gender, when they were diagnosed and how old they were. The types, the status. It's the largest registry in the world, all of patients volunteering and connecting data to look at this. And you can drill into lots of components. You can filter by you know, a, a brain fog, which is the symptoms that patients describe. They know what this means, all coded back to normal medical terms for research. You can look at other patients experiencing severe brain fog or look at patients without MS that also experience severe brain fog. So I could look at an Asperger's patient or someone that has fibromyalgia they believe they have the same symptom. These are all components that, that, that are part of medical care about learning from each other in real time. We tell every patient about every clinical trial within 25 miles of their house for every indication they have, and they can say they tried to enroll or not because we believe it should be part of the research enterprise. All of this comes together to build a learning health system. Now, we get some benefits from this system. Users report, this is from epilepsy data we published, that showed that they understand their seizures, they understand their side effects, they manage their condition better, they have fewer visits to the ER. If I had a drug that produced ER visits in epilepsy patients by 18%, would I be being paid to deliver that kind of service? Now this is not because patients are doing something on their own. They are not doing self-care they're collaborating more effectively with their doctors. In this case, 21% of the patients insisted on seeing an epileptologist because of evidence that they were not getting sufficient care from their current doctors. In fact, 10% of the patients in our system claim that they fired their doctor based on their understanding of the quality of care they got using it and got a new one. So we're driving people to the best care. Interestingly, we also find that we can get people married. In fact, each of our diseases seems to have one or two marriages that are caused in this, which as a clinical researcher, I'm kind of intrigued by the opportunities for genetic and behavioral research on. You know, I think the, the real point of medicine, when a clinician is doing a great job, they're making a prediction. They're holistically interpreting the data about the patient and saying, I expect the following. And if we do this, we hope it will be different. And then when the patient comes back and they're not matching expectations, either it's good news and we stay the course, or it's bad news and we change and we update the treatments. What if the prediction were no longer something that were subjective or holistic because the amount of data in medicine is now exceeding the human's ability to integrate that data effectively? What if the prediction was mathematical? So if I said, computer, go and get me the 10 patients most like Humberto, tell me using an integrated predictive algorithm, Humberto's functional status 12 years from now. So integrate that data into a combined prediction for this individual. It's his control group. And it projects his future. And over the next 12 months, he followed it. And he died at the 75th percentile of the controls. That's kind of scary how powerful that kind of data could be. The patients are desperate to know what can be known. They want this information, they want these tools, and medicine should be embracing quantitative prediction as a way of finding the future. But you can do more with this. When you can predict an individual patient's outcome, you can use it to sum up the comprehensive effects of a single treatment. So do you remember the study I told you about lithium and ALS that was refuted by the four clinical trials? In the year it took to start up those clinical trials, hundreds of ALS patients started using lithium with their doctors. And we monitored them in our system. And this is what happened to those, MS, those ALS patients. And you can see the very small blue dots at the top and the purple ones coming down. That was the original paper with that big separation that was so exciting. And you see our bars that have zero overlap, I'm sorry, uh, zero separation, and that dotted line that is our power. So by observing, Patients taking a new drug, we demonstrated it had absolutely no effect before a single patient enrolled in $30 million worth of follow-up clinical trials, all of which failed for futility at six months. This is the most powered study that refuted the original finding. So this is what happens when you begin to approach medicine in a different way. And we published this, and this is used, interestingly, largely by drug companies because they're the ones that have to demonstrate that things work. All right. 
So quick summary in my last minute. These are broken systems. We should imagine something new. Something new is a new system, one system, that is based on measurement. And we should measure the severity and impact of disease to support, at every moment that it matters, the patient and their life choices, the clinician and the care choices, and the researchers in understanding the disease. Those components, those three customers for each piece of data, would allow us to build an integrated learning health system. To do that, we have to move away from the poetry of diagnosis to the math of clinical research. In the practice of care, we have to understand severity and impact and the characteristics of the disease in quantitative assessed ways across disease. And all of this results in one objective, shortening the time to know whether an intervention works in a single patient. If you think about the dreams we have in discovery in healthcare, the triple cocktail in HIV, Gleevec for treatment of CML, these things came from the ability to detect rapidly and effectively the intervention, the discovery of a lab that told you whether the patient was responding quickly. Medicine should be serving the shortening of this time you know, after trying multiple trials of my brother, I worked on the wrong problem. I wanted to find a diagnostic that would give me more shots on goal. I want to score. Medicine should be basketball and not soccer. It shouldn't take us 12 years to get a treatment across the line. We should be trying continuously and learning. My belief is that if windows, the patients are the window to the soul of medicine, and if they are the eyes of this new voyage, that we can imagine something, not just how do we do the things that we do now, half of which are wrong and we don't know which half, more effectively or more deployed or whatever. We can imagine something better than that. We can imagine a transition to a system that works on health itself because it measures it and understands it and extends and improves human life, well-being, and productivity. And that's the system we should be building using patients as the key sensor to make it happen. Thank you.